There are so many demands on you. Demands at home, in the boardroom, and in the bedroom. You have to be jack of all trades, wearing a different hat when the moment arises. You're on all the time. Always on the clock, always catching up. <sighs> Take care of you. Introducing your media, your podcast network that meets you where you are, when you need it, at your time, in your space, when you feel like it. You come first. Your media, where you are. With every moment, you are creating an impression. Make sure it's an impression by design. This is The Transcript with Tiamo. Well, we're back again. And if you're listening to the sound of my voice, then you know that you're tuned in to The Transcript with me, Tiamo Mudisane. And it's most likely to be a Sunday. If not, welcome. This is The Transcript with me, Tiamo Mudisane. Today's topic or today's discussion, conversation, is um, centered around reflections. And the reason for this is because I'm joined by someone who is debuting a book. I don't know if it's your first book. My first, yeah. Yeah. So his first book, and it's called um, Reflections and Essays. Listens to your footsteps, yes. Yeah. It was just an easy way of... Instead of having to write a, you know, writing a book from beginning to end is very, very hard. Yeah. So if you call that reflections, Reflections and Essays, you can write short thoughts, and that's just the easier way of doing it. Thank you so much. And with that said, ladies and gentlemen, um, well, welcome writer, author, um, producer. It's so hard. Like for my editor, you, your, your bio is like on and on and like the professional slasher, like you are slash, so slash, you know the problem slash, with my bio slash. is I realized this the other day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know when you, you put your bio on like social media, mm-hmm. everything of mine is like X this. It's like I'm only as good as what my my your past, next gig. My, my past glory. <laughs> like, no, but these I'm are things you've done. I'm an editor. I'm an ex this. But I'm now you're currently an right author. Now, yeah, right now, it's it's labels. Look, I mean, I've I've been lucky in that. I don't know whether it's lucky, but I've never operated with with those boxes or those labels that were given mm-hmm. um, because I've done so many different things. Um, so you know. Especially in a city like Johannesburg, where you know conversations usually start with, um, "So what do you do?" I find uh, that hard to answer myself because so I'm just like, "What don't I yeah. do?" So I'm like, "Yo, man, I'm I'm here." Ne? I think more than anything, you're creative. That's what I lead with. I I usually say I'm a storyteller. That's beautiful. Or a writer, or a father. I mean, those are those are the. Being a father is probably the more important, the one. The more important job mm. compared to everything else. <laughs> okay, so let me just give you a bio. Let me read your bio that I have now researched. Let's go for it. Or rather taken from your website. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so of Ghanaian and German um, heritage, raised in Lesotho and currently based in Johannesburg, South Africa, Kojo is a pro uh, Pro, what is that? Proverbial. 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 Slasher. Professional jack of all trades. He is an entrepreneur, writer, facilitator, content architect, former men's magazine editor and speaker. So I'm a former magazine editor three times. Three times. Um, I'm also a former radio talk show host. Uh, I'm a former TV producer mm-hmm. and former TV researcher. Um, yeah, like I said, all past glory. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know. And I've like I've always known you're Canadian. I didn't know that you're German as well. Yeah, my mother was German. Oh, my nice. You and um, what's his name? Boris Kojo. Yes, they have couple, same. There are a couple of us. Um, same heritage. Yeah, we're not. We're, you know, Ghanaians. If you look at West Africans, but Ghanaians specifically from independence, and even the lead up to independence, which was 1957. Like Ghanaians have traveled around the world and lived around the world, and and um, 
acquired offspring and spouses from different backgrounds and different cultures. So yeah. my father ended up in Germany as a student and ended up staying there for 12 years and met my mother and they got married and then moved to Uganda. So wow, that's it's, not a, it's not a, because of, I guess because of South Africa's history, it always feels like an anomaly. Mm -hmm. But if you think about, like if you go to West Africa, you go to East Africa, um, even places like Zim, where you know citizens went to the UK, went to different countries, um, I'm I'm less of an anomaly, you know, I'm less of an anomaly outside of South Africa. The problem with South Africa is that because we still here look at complexion, mm -hmm. it's it's about complexion, it's about race, um, and that's how you're then bundled uh, within South Africa. I mean, when I first started, come, when I first came here, and then I'm told you're colored. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Um, this is also something um, I. The conversation you're saying now is the same conversation I had with um, Mal Bala, hmm. because she's also yeah. mixed, and now and we had that t we touched on that. Say, are you colored? Are you mixed race? Especially in South Africa, where colored is actually a race. Hmm. If you think about it, like we're the only place in the world where colored is a race. So how I define it, um, and it took me a long time to get there, uh, is colored is an ethnic group. Mm -hmm. It's ethnic group like you have, we won't get into history. Yes, but, yes, yes, yes. But it's an ethnic group like you'd have Basoto or Tswana or, you know, anything else mm -hmm. within a South African context. So my wife is colored and... I remember we were being interviewed um, and the interview was around coming from different cultural backgrounds. And her work colleagues were like, yeah, but why are they interviewing the two of you? Because they look at us and they go, well, you're both colored mm -hmm. because it's a race thing. Whereas, yes. whereas you know, um, when, when I married into a colored, you know, when I married into when I married a colored woman, I discovered like they have their own ritual and culture and practice like everybody else. Yeah. You know? yeah. So that's how I look at it. Um, I don't look at it from a race perspective. I look at it from, let's call it a cult cultural or ethnic groups perspective. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. And I mean, you speak fluent Sutu as a go, how say they hand to hand? No. <laughs> um, I give <laughs> And what I try to do is, at least with people that I'm trying to be nice, I try to nip it in the bud early <laughs> and by, putting, by putting it on the table before they say anything. So you, you just go to my like, oh, Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I was you, though, I'd definitely like keep quiet and just l listen to everything. Because for me, I mean, there's no, you know, you are a good looking man. So I'd want to hear that conversation because I'm sure it's just like, mm, mm, mm. It's, it's, I mean, it's different things. So it doesn't, it, I mean, it doesn't happen. I never go anywhere. So that's probably why it doesn't happen as much. Mm -hmm. But um, it is a, so it, it is an interesting thing I find because it goes back to some of the, ch some of the, how we perceive things in this country, right? Um, in that, you know, I grew up in Lesotho and I went to the free state all the time. Like you go to Bloemfontein and there'll be a, Afrikaans man, Afrikaans woman walking down the road speaking so sort of better than, you know, better than you could ever dream of. Um, you know, so that same thing happens in like in the Val yeah. as well. Um, or Eastern Cape, you know, with, yeah. or even KZN. Um, so it's, I think it's sad that, it's, it's sad that we've, we've, we are at the point where, because we assume and unfortunately, majority of the time the assumption is correct um so a, a friend of mine used to say nike was sort of it's like the old chinese movies like they see my lips yes and, and then you just like but the language coming <laughs> out it doesn't connect so i've spoken to people where they speak the language mm -hmm. but because their brain goes no this person couldn't possibly be speaking saying this the word language. yes <laughs> they don't understand me and i can see it like, like, like you're dubbed. I can like see they'll it. They'll stand and they'll look at me. Or they'll answer, they'll answer in English and know that they're answering. 
<laughs> but you can see so much is going on. So much is going on in the head and in the brain and in the face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and it, and it's funny because because I grew up in Lesotho. I speak Sesotho Sesotho, right? Is it but, but I speak Sesotho sa tropo. So I can Lesotho if I go outside of Maseru. Like my Sesotho city Sesotho. But in Joburg because also there's all these languages and everything mixed in mm-hmm. sometimes i'll use a word and people will be like my god you're so 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 perfect and i i, I don't speak so all the time i mean none of, nobody in my family speaks it mm-hmm. um here i haven't been home in what three, four years so i'll go I'll, i've gone months without speaking so 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 obviously it like my vocabulary is affected you don't you speak so your, your kids no 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 um That's another story in itself. I actually wrote about it in the book because before I had kids, um, I have an older sister and I used to, my brother-in-law's from from Toyando. And I used to give give them grief about why my nephews and my nieces are not learning, you know, um, whether it's Chivenda or um, Sesotho or my older sister, I mean, because we have different mothers so our mothers Ghanaian so there's even there's multiple Ghanaian languages yep. and I used to give them grief about it all the time and then I had a child then I realized that you know what? it's not easy <laughs> eh? like all of these things and I'm sure that's what they said to you like wait we'll yeah, wait yeah, yeah. No, they, they didn't say anything they're just going to look at me and go hmm and it's one of those situations where you need to go through it to realize that okay because there's all the theories and I'm a reader mm-hmm. so you read about it and they'll say one's parents speak the la- one language and other parents speak the other language those things are hard to do mm-hmm. yeah, so yeah no my none of my children speak my 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 I mean they're studying my son is doing he's he's now just started high school um is he your eldest and he's doing isuzul i mean they both do it but mm-hmm. up to i think it was up to grade three, they do at the school that they're at they do in, um afrikaans and isuzul and then they choose and i was just like look they're not going to learn afrikaans i mean my wife speaks it but yeah. I, was, i was just like they don't have susutu um i don't speak isuzul i understand here and there but it's it's not really in my mind for me there's no option it's like this is the most spoken language in this country and and i'm i'm constantly trying to show my son how when you speak a person's language it makes for a different interaction mm. um so you know going into government offices or you get stopped by you know, you get stopped by the police uh uh-huh. yes. you Our switch friends. you switch languages especially f- for somebody like me because i'm i'm, Face I'm a novelty <laughs> um but the fact that i'll speak the language mm. says okay it says a lot about you as a human being 100% yeah it just makes really relate like relating yeah so you're like oh okay yeah okay. yeah but you sound like you had a very colorful upbringing i'm hearing like all your your siblings yeah, you know, your parents so so i used to do this talk um on race and identity to high school kids and my opening line was i'm half german half ghanian from lesotho i come from a family of five kids of three different ma- mothers from three of three different nationalities all brought up by my father but for me it's simple mm-hmm. so it's it's i just find that i guess when you're in the middle of something um you know it was it's your truth it w- yeah exactly Yeah you know, um people like so cool that your you know your father's Ghanaian kind of, your mother was German I'm like yo man like I had no role <laughs> in my parents growing <laughs> yeah. up and I had no role in what countries they happened to come from yeah. and um and I grew up in Maseru in a very interesting time I mean I went to international school we had some stage I think over 30 40 different nationalities in the school um also it was it was kind of the height of apartheid so you had a lot of people basing themselves in Lesotho mm-hmm. because you could access South Africa. Mm-hmm. So I mean the you know in high school I had friends who were Swedes and Portuguese and Ugandan and Nigerian and American and French and just a total mix and yeah. all teenagers growing up together. 
And because Lesotho was totally surrounded by South Africa, and for example, my father was banned here, so I didn't come. I didn't come to South Africa a lot. I literally just flew out in transit. And you know, we got our music from the US and the UK. Uh, all our influences came from, funny enough, outside. Although we had South African TV, mm-hmm. so it made for it made for an interesting time to grow up. Um, and it made for interesting influences, but it's you know it's just one of those things. Like for me, it's just yeah, that's how I grew up. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so yeah, it's it's it sounds it sounds cool, um, but like everybody else, you go through <laughs> the same stuff. <laughs> I mean, trying to figure out who you are, yeah, especially when you hit your late teens. When you get to that stage where you're like, okay, who am I? You know, you're going through, you're going through this. I mean, we still have adults. I think the purpose yeah. of the show is to help people find that answer to that question. But in terms of like going through that process, like for me, it was heavy. It was particularly heavy right after high school, mm-hmm. um, and and I mean, it was interesting because so I went to school in Lesotho, and then after I finished high school. I went to Germany for a year as an exchange student. Um, so I went to also, I used that to kind of reconnect with my roots and mm-hmm. I got to see my aunts and my cousins. Um, and then I came back and this was, this was what, 91. So I came back uh, mid-91 and then I worked in Lesotho. And in Europe, nobody confused me for anything other than I was, yeah. which is probably biracial. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, when people see you, they look at you. They're like, "Yeah, it's it's common." Yeah, it's a thing. Um, and then I, and then I work for like six, seven months, and then I go to university in Durban in 1992. Mm. And I get to university, and I'm in res, and I'm on a floor with mainly Zulu speakers, and like my circle of friends. I was talking to somebody I went to varsity with the other day, and like my main circle of friends were all Kosa in Durban, right, uh, in 92. So, like, my best like my best friend then, who, and we're still very close now, um, you know, the girlfriends I had, that was my circle. Yeah. You know? And then getting there and being told, uh, so you're colored. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. Yeah. And then, you know, firstly, I don't know what that is. Secondly, I'm trying to figure out who I am. Like, there's all of these things. And then I'm in Mosoto. Yes. Right? And I'm in Mosoto within the space. And and so that was, that was for me, the start of the kind of, okay, where do I fit into the general scheme of things? Um, and, I mean, I, am, I'm, I think I've by and large got it. Mm-hmm. Um, it also helps turning 40. Um, oh, you're also going to say life begins at 40? Uh, no, no, I wouldn't say life begins at 40. It's just it's just like this whole, you know, what's it? It was like 30s, the new 20. Uh, t- you know, I'm yeah. like, yo, man, like, like 30s, 30, 30, 40s, 40. And like, I feel it. <laughs> I, you know, I do feel um, like 30s, the new, the new 20, though, because everyone wants to be 30 now. And when you get to 30, the work starts. Like, that's when the actual work begins. So 30 for me was a... I woke up 30 years old. It was like, it was profound. Mm-hmm. Turning 30 was profound because I woke up and I was like, actually, do you know what? This is me. All right. This is me. Um, what's and all. Mm-hmm. Um, I became a lot more accepting of myself. And the things that, the things that I felt needed to change were things that I felt needed to change. Not what other, other people, people. Oh, that's felt deep. What mm-hmm. needed to change. Right. And it was an ongoing process. Um, 40, I just, like, I totally stopped caring about <laughs> other people. Yeah, you know, it's, and, and it's an it's a interesting shift. Mm-hmm. You know? so, I look, so I look at my father. My father passed away, he was 81. And my father would mess up names. Yeah, he would mess up names. Like, in general, or at 81? No, I mean, so, for like 10 years, 15 years, like, if he heard it wrong, I'd be like, no, this is Tiamo. And he's like, oh, it's Solofel. <laughs> and that's it. You're Solofel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd correct him. And he'd be like, mm, yeah, okay. Yeah. 
And then the one day I realized, so I realized this watching uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu <laughs> at, at, uh, at Madiba's memorial at FNB Stadium because mm-hmm. he came on towards the end and people were being unruly and stuff and he yeah. got on stage and he went, hey, hey. <laughs> and if you looked on social media, he was like, oh my God, he's embarrassing us, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that man, he's over 70. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do to exactly. him? Exactly. Like, what can you do to him? Yeah. And after I started getting deeper into 40, that's I, I was like, yeah, actually. Like, now I'm 49 years old. Um, if you take offense at something, mm-hmm. that's your offense, not mine. I always say. Like, I'm not worried. You know, if, if you don't like me, mm-hmm. that's your problem. It's not my problem. Yeah. Unless you start to impose on my life. Yes. Then it becomes my then problem. It, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, so you don't particularly like me sharp. Like, you know, not everybody's going to like me. Yeah. I think for me, the one thing I've learned, or the one quote, it's not even a quote, a saying that has helped me adjust, especially when I turned 30, was understanding that um, offense is taken mm. and not given. Mm. So for me, that even helps me with me to say, why am I offended? Like, why am I taking this offense? Offensive, you know what I mean? And why am I finding this offensive? Is I need to sit down and then unpack it properly for yeah. myself to and then say, okay, is it really a thing is, you know? And I think that only comes with, I want to say, doing the work or taking time to yeah. actually know and figure out who you are in the greater scheme of things. And that way, whatever influences come up along, you're just like, actually, this is hmm. where we're going. And this is, you know? And it will work some, we'll look, we'll work some progress. Mm. So you never, you never figure it out once and go, okay, I've figured it out. Yeah, correct. Like, um, you know, you'll figure it out for them. Yes. And then something else will happen. You go, ooh, I need to relook at this thing. So, I mean, one of the things I've lear- I'm learning is being open to, you know, being open to that journey. Mm-hmm. So I understand my thread. I understand my lane. Like, I understand where my lines are. Yeah. Right. And, you know, within, and, and those lines are defined by me. It's not defined by the world, right? It's, it's like, this is what I'm comfortable with. This is what I'm not comfortable with. Yeah. These are things that I'll do. These are things that I won't do. Um, and, you know, they're important to me. Like, the, I have my boundaries. <laughs> but it's also just remembering that sometimes, yo, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I learn it. I mean, I f- I'm a freelancer and I work for myself and, I've jumped between different spaces. So I'm forced to constantly reflect on that. Mm-hmm. Like I'll go, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And then next week something else comes and it's like, hey, I have my space school fees. So I guess <laughs> this is what we're doing. <laughs> it's like, I guess this is what we're doing now. You know? and, mm-hmm. and also not having, I don't, I don't operate with a pre- preconceived idea of, because I've never built a career. Mm. So I've never been a career person. Like I've done things Mm -hmm. and I've pursued projects which made sense at the time. Mm -hmm. And when they stopped making sense, I left. You exit. And I went to something else, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, Well, sometimes I was forced to leave them. But but literally it's, that's kind of how I've engaged with stuff. Mm -hmm. So because of that, it's, it's, I'm constantly having to remind myself that, you know what, I can't, I can't, I can't be so set in my ways that I'm going to block myself off. Or if I'm too set in my ways, I end up blocking myself mm-hmm. off from opportunity that's out there. And because I am dependent on myself, um, I need to be open to the opportunities that arise. And sometimes I've done stuff just like that. It's like having a conversation with somebody's like, ah, I can do this for you. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool, let's do it. And then I start doing it, and I'm like, hmm, actually, this might be something. I never thought that, you know, th- but this might be something yeah. to pursue. Okay. So before we get into mm. your your book, I have a surprise for you. Okay. Um, yeah, let me just play the surprise. I don't know if I like surprises, but okay. I think you're going to like it. So, let's see if it's,
Yo, Kojo, what's up, my man? Uh, my man, you are incredibly the prototypical content creator. Um, whether it be in print or radio or digital or poetry and music, now podcasts, finally your first book. Um, I really hope that you really reflect on the true breadth of your experiences. Um, you've been such a source of inspiration and excellence when it comes to just this constant desire and fuel to create and tell all these impactful stories. So I know as you share a bit more about yourself with this new hat as a published author, um, so many more people are going to grow. Um, as my big brother, you've been a, a great example of what it means to lead your family and your circle. And uh, I'm, I hope, man, that I'm this cool as more gray hairs uh, start to come through. But honestly, uh, I count it a real privilege to be your friend and to be able to see this just constant evolution um, firsthand. So peace, my man. Um, congrats. And uh, we'll grab that stogie soon. Peace. Okay. Who's that? <laughs> it's Mushambi. Mushambi Mutuma. In fact, I was talking to him last night. <laughs> um, yeah, do you know what? Um, it's always like it's 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 weird. So it's weird hearing him speak like that mm-hmm. because of my nature. Well, the nature of I guess relationships, mm-hmm. um, and that for me, it's kind of it's like you. You send me an email saying, "Listen, uh, this is what I'm doing. Will you do an interview?" Mm-hmm. Right? We haven't seen each other in ages, ages, but you're somebody that I've interacted with. I've seen around. It's like, okay, I like this person. Yeah. So if they're doing this thing, it must be cool. If I can help in any way in terms of helping it progress. Yeah. And if if to help is coming and lending my voice, then I'm happy to do that. It's not a, it's not something that, it's it's not something that I'm. Um, let's say deliberate about and that it's like, okay, okay, let me do this because it's going to do X, Y, Z. Correct. It's, it's just a, yo, like, okay, this person, this, this situation, I'm in a situation where I can contribute to it. Um, you know, if I didn't like the person, then it's a different, it's a different <laughs> conversation. Uh, and, and, Thank God. and there are very few people that I, I, c- I can say I dislike. Yes. Like I don't, I don't go out on my way to, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's really cool hearing it, but then I listen to it and it's like, okay, yeah, but it's the it's it's um so it's the formal it's the formal it's the author it's the person saying the thing for this, right? Um or it's or it's communicated with us sitting across from each other to the the tone and the let's say the familiarity. Mm-hmm. in the language would have been very different. So it's just, it was entertaining for me because I'm like, I'm listening to him. It's like, yeah, you know, let's work him. Like, you know, that's, that's like work mode. Like, just like when we started. Yeah. You're a work mode, right? So Correct, yeah. The way the conversation is going to flow is slightly different and the way you're going to present yourself is slightly different. It's not good or bad. It's just different from if we'd met each other at a function. Um, and... Going back to let's say the the growing older thing, is like more and more I'm just comfortable being like this is me. I had a client call, a corporate client this this afternoon, and I looked exactly the way I look. Yeah, and I interacted exactly the <laughs> way. <I'm right> <laughs> and yeah, but I mean it was very very cool to very cool to get that message. So it it was a good surprise. I'm not a big surprises person. Okay. Uh, okay, so listening to your footsteps, reflections, and essays, Hmm. right? A collection of essays, thoughts, and poems that are reflections of your journey to date, the lessons you have learned and continue to learn along the way. Who you are today um, is heavily heavily shaped by your father who raised you. So I'm going to read it as Hmm. you wrote it, right? Because now it's just like confusing me. So yeah, it's who I am today, who I am today was heavily shaped by my father who raised me by my steps and missteps. I like that actually in work relationships and life and by my children. That's the part where I want to 
touch on because I feel like most most people don't do that. And it's kind of interesting. I consider myself a contemporary African man, but am gripped by constantly, uh, no? Yeah, constantly with what, sorry, see? With what that really, what with what that really means. But I think that's what we touched on earlier on. Yeah, and and also you must remember, like we're living in. I think we're living in heavy times, mm-hmm. uh, particularly in this country. Uh, it's a global. So, for example, patriarchy and violence against, you know, women, and children is something that, is a global struggle. Um, I would argue that in South Africa, it's at pandemic levels. Um, And so I spend, I mean, I spend some time thinking about these things. Like I don't have the answers for them, but they're the things that, I mean, especially because now I have a boy, I have a son and a daughter, you know, and, and it's also sometimes monitoring and policing myself, you know, because it's, you know, you may go, okay, well, it's about equality, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. then in your language, without thinking about it, you know, as a parent or you know, even, I mean, I find that sometimes even my friends who are women will do that. Like they'll say something which just reinforces, reinforces, you know, how the world has looked at things for so long. Mm-hmm. And sometimes to change that, we need to change the language, you know, like, sure. um, and so, yeah, I, I do spend I do spend kind of a bit of time just thinking about all of these things, and and so that's what the book is. Mm-hmm. The book is, you know, I, I said sometimes it's weird. Like I'll be in the middle of an experience, but I'll be watching the experience at the same time. So uh, in an outer body, y- yeah. Kind of. so, well, it's, it's a certain, I guess, a certain element of detachment. Um, but because of that and because I kind of observe things and like to read things and try to understand things, um, the book was an opportunity for me to to start to share some of those things. So, I mean, I talk about like being raised by my father mm-hmm. um, and what that meant and how that's impacted on my relationships. Um, I wrote an essay called Breaking the Cycle where I realized that while I was writing, my father wasn't, my father didn't have his mother in his life and I didn't have my mother in my life. Uh, but my son is being raised with his mother in his life. Mm. So there's certain things that you'll find that are common in myself and my father, which are not necessarily positive. Like it could be coping mechanisms. It could be a particular perspectives um, that I need to actually step out of the way because I can't be passing that on to a child who has both parents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's it's thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, that's what I do with my spare time. I sit there and randomly think about but the, I mean, you, all I, these you, things. You would expect it from someone like you, you know. And I, what I mean by that is you you come across as someone who's just like wealthly knowledged. Like you know, you are. Yeah, you because you read a lot. You you come across as somebody who's just like very highly opinionated and informed and insightful. So you have to come to you correct. Like for me, I think even in the space, me even getting to know you was purely intentional because I wanted to, I wanted you to know me for my work Mm. and not because we go to events or whatever, but I just needed to, to sort of prove myself. And I think that takes a lot of hard work to do where you, I don't want to say create a brand, but you create, you know, a persona or you are this person that just comes across as that. like, so, so even when I was preparing, I was like, I need to get my ducks in a row. But here's the weird thing. Um, I've spent my last, let's say, give it, say 15 years in the media space mm-hmm. trying to do the same thing like trying to be recognized for my work as opposed to all these trimmings around. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but I think that's the key. So also like when I met you and when you came into the industry, you came into the industry doing something, right? Working on something. Yeah. Um, It wasn't just the, 
hey, I hang out or I am famous or whatever it is. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's how a lot of us come to that space, right? But externally, what happened, especially in the last, I'd say in the last seven, eight years, with social media and influencers and all of this other stuff, there was a shift of focus from, for a lot of people, your work, to kind of who you hang out with, yeah. what you wear, et cetera, et cetera. But I am fortunate that I don't come, one, I don't come from that school. Um, when I was a destiny man, so for a lot of people, and it, it used to be amusing to me sometimes, irritating other times, mm -hmm. uh, because I was a destiny man, and then all of a sudden I was discovered. So all of a sudden I became someone, um, according to society, yeah. I became someone. Yeah. I started work at Destiny Man August August um, 2010. I was 38 years old. I started working for my father when I was like 12, 13 on weekends and holidays. Like I worked right through school. I worked right through university. Mm -hmm. When I finished university in 1994, I went and I worked full time. I moved to Joburg. I started, I've started businesses, I've shut down businesses, I've done different work. But after all of that, I get to Destiny Man. And only sudden, now. All of a sudden, now I have a value. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But because of the nature of that work, what I appreciated was people were connecting with me because of my work. Because that's what I was giving you. Yeah. I'm giving you my work. Like, this is, this is it. Um, and I take pride in that. Like I said, it used to irritate me sometimes because people like, oh yeah, destiny man, destiny man. I'm like, guys, like I've been around for a while, eh? Yeah. You know, like I've done things. Um, but because of the nature of society. So one of the things that I always tell people, and there's a talk that I did, like, and it's weird because in a way my life has, it feels like everything has happened by accident, but I call the talk, don't let your life happen by accident. Mm -hmm. And I... I look at I look at kind of some of the lessons that I've learned over the years. And one of them was like one find your lane, right? Like find your lane, stick to your lane. Mm -hmm. Um other one which has always been important to me, let your work speak for you. So this idea of a brand, yeah. Um, I still can't get my head around it even now. And like mm -hmm. people be like, you know, brand coach, I'm like so my pinned tweet is I'm a human being being human. That's because being human, part of being human is being a professional and working. Mm -hmm. And so I've worked many, many years to build a, a reputation as a professional, as mm -hmm. a human being, et cetera. That's what I work at. So I'm not, you know, I'm not thinking about, okay, what's my brand and all of these things. I mean, I get people going, uh, can I join or oh, hi, Team Kojo? And I'm like, Team Kojo is like one guy. <laughs> He does the sales. He but does it's the, info, Ed. So you just like actually. Yeah. But he does the sales. He does the <laughs> he does the work. He does the invoicing. He he. I mean, today when I was on my way here, I was actually tweeting, and I'm like, uh, I need to fill in vendor forms for a potential new client, and it says if your payment terms are not 30 days from statement, you must motivate why. And I'm like, well. I need the money. How's that? Yeah. Like, like I'm not working and I'm a small business and I live hand to mouth. Also, why must we want to, I need the money. Obviously I did this because I need the money. Simple. So, so I've, I don't know whether I compartmentalize, uh, but I focus on, I focus on the work and I don't, I try not to get carried away by everything else. And I always used to say when I was a destiny man, if I'd, I mean, I very, I, I very really, I very rarely have ego trips. Mm -hmm. um, I do think highly of myself, but that's usually just on my own and my in privacy. Like, you know, um, but, but I remember when I was destiny man and, and, and I think, you know, it's like we're doing something here. The magazine's doing well, what, 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 what? And then I'd be some, and I'm like, Oh, Kojo's editor of destiny man. Oh, is that a new title? And I'm like, well, I've been doing this thing for three years. It's been around for four years. And people are like, Oh, is that a new title? Like, and it's like, actually, that's the thing. Not everybody's going to know. You know, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a Bonang. I'm not a Maps. Yeah. But I feel like you are. But, now you are. Nah, no. But even that, 
it's like you'll meet somebody who's like, Maps Mapanyani, who's that? Yeah. Yeah. Right? And that's the thing that I always remind myself. It like it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter how big you are. There's gonna be people who don't know who you are. Yeah. And that's that's cool. That's the way of the world. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, I'm naturally curious. That's why I and I believe that it's it's a very valuable tool to have. Um and I try and encourage people to be that, like just be curious, curious about stuff, mm -hmm. um, because that's the reason why I may seem knowledgeable about a lot of things. But it's just like I'm curious about stuff. Like I'm fascinated by random things. You know, like I've stood and watched a what's called a master cooper put together a barrel for whiskey. All right take it apart and put it together. And I'm I'm there. Like guys are like, yo, let's go. I'm like, no, hold on, hold yeah. on, hold on. Like. Do you see what this guy is doing? Yeah. Right? And if you do, somebody else will look at it and go, yeah, but it's just putting something together. Um, and I mean, when I had a radio show, I remember my, my one producer said to me, she's like, do you realize that everybody you talk to, eventually you go, okay, so how do you do it? Yeah. Like, how do you make the thing? And, and she was like, you always ask that question. And I was like, yeah, actually, it's because I'm I'm curious about how things are done, mm -hmm. you know. And when I'm talking to somebody, I want to, you know, I want to know, okay, how did they do it? Because I don't know how to do it. Yes. It looks interesting. So, I mean, those things have helped me and held me, I'd say, in good stead over the years. And they continue to help, you know, to help me today. Um, I've, you know, I've, when I go to clients and I'm doing some writing for from clients or developing an editorial strategies like i can find something interesting in anything in anything yeah so it helps you know because now i'm dealing with a client and they're like yeah we're just a financial institution and then i'm like yo man but like that guy that you have there who works on your it systems mm -hmm. like i want to talk to that guy <laughs> yeah so yeah so what is, what is the the um, what gravitated what what drew me to the book was when you were writing the description when I read it on Instagram and I was like, I wonder what lessons you've learned from your dad and from your kids. Yeah, there's a lot. What's the one? There's a lot. The uh, one when you sit and you're like, actually my dad. Um look, my father my father always used to say that as buffers we have very few principles, but they're important to us. Um one is kind of, I guess, respect. It's how you treat people. It's how you interact and how you treat with other human beings. Um, so it's respect for yourself and respect for others. Um, I'd say that's that's kind of at the core of it. So, um, you know, my father would go, you sit at a restaurant and by the time you leave, he's buddy-buddy with the waiter. And the, so he, you know, he'd always take that little extra time to have conversations with people. Um, and And if you think about it, it's tied to language, you know. Sawon, I see you. Yeah. Right. Um, and also, growing up in Lesotho, that was something that was very important. Like I've seen fights happen because you did not acknowledge that I was there. You don't have to like me. I always say. But when uh, so everywhere I've worked, any place I go, get mm -hmm. When I walk in, it's like I'd go around the whole office. Morning, hey. And I had issues at some stage. I had issues with somebody because every time I greeted him, he never replied. Um, so I'd say it's that it's, it's being able to acknowledge and see people and afford every human being the kind of respect of, of being there and existing. Um, at, for me, that's kind of at the heart of it. Also, my father did a lot without people seeing or without people knowing in terms of being able to, help other people um, and he was a pan-africanist and i was brought up with the same you know the same philosophy and the same approach and it's 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 not in the big things it's in the small things you know so i mean a random story he passed away in 2006 and so i drove down to my server the following day i get a phone call from a number in botswana and this person's like, listen, this is my name. Um, my daughter lives in Joburg and I got your number through her. She found your number. Um, your father used to be my lecturer in Uganda. 
So we're talking 1973, 1974. And we, he was like, we were trying to get him to come to Botswana. So I know that in, in terms of our history, it was between Botswana and Lesotho. Okay. And we, he, he was deciding between those two because my mother passed away in Uganda. So he wanted to leave and he was deciding between those two. And we ended up in Lesotho because an uncle of mine was, was already there. Mm-hmm. So this person literally hadn't even been in contact with my father. But you're talking, what, over 40 years later, felt the need to pick up the phone and phone to pass on his condolences. And he was like, listen, I'd have come, but I'm also sickly. Mm-hmm. All right. That was the first one. Second one was on Instagram. He passed away in December, probably end of Jan. Mm-hmm. I get a message, direct message on Instagram. So there's a young guy in Lesotho. He, there's a, one of these top scholarships for, or fellowships um, to the U.S. Like, I can't remember which one it is, but you know, you have the Rockefeller Foundation. This, yeah. that. So one of the prestigious ones. And he, my father insisted that he apply. And he was just dilly-dallying and not, you know, not filling in the forms and stuff. And my father made him come and sit in his office across from him and fill in. Because it's not, it's, it's, it's with those application forms where you must write essays and yeah. all of that stuff. He made him sit down and do it and made sure that it was sent. And he got it. I mean, he's now, he's now, he's still in the U.S. I was actually chatting to him earlier on the week. Um, he's in the U.S. I think he has his master's now. Look but that. he got, so he got the thing and my father wasn't there for him to thank him. So he sent me a message on Instagram. He's like, listen, I, I need to thank somebody. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let me, what we're we going to do. So let this. me rather thank you. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, so, I mean, that, mm-hmm. I think that's at the heart of it. That, that's the core of it. Yeah. Um, in terms of what I've learned from my kids, yo, I'm still learning. And the, yeah, the lessons, children, children will show you flames. <laughs> Anytime you think you've got it figured out, mm-hmm. um, they go through another transition mm-hmm. because they're also coming into themselves. Yes. Right? They're coming to themselves, you're working with baggage, um, you're trying to find a balance. Mm-hmm. Like You're also trying to you know, raise human beings that are respectful and you know, not too spoiled or yeah. whatever it is. Like, you know, you're trying to create a foundation for them, but you're also trying to guide them. Yeah. But sometimes your guidance, I mean, in, enough times I've done something and then turned it around and I'm just like, oh, I think I messed that up. <laughs> right? Like, I, I, maybe I shouldn't have reacted that way. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. And you're flying by the seat of your pants. And then just when you think you got a rhythm going on, I mean, like, <laughs> I have a teenager now in the house. Um, and I have a teenager who is, I am my father's son. Mm-hmm. When people made met my father, I made sense. Okay. And people who, people who had never met my father, like, my people in Joburg. I mean, I did poetry books years ago and I remember I did a launch and my father was guest of honor. Mm-hmm. And I could see people that I've been interacting with for the last couple of years, listening to my father speak and then looking at me and then listen to my father and look at me. You can just be, oh, that's why. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, that's why he's like that. And my son is different, obviously different personalities, it changes, but it's also another chip off the old block, mm-hmm. which makes for which makes for interesting conflict and interesting tension, mm. you know, because it's, you know, my father always wanted the last word. I always want the last word. My son always wants the last word. Mm. All right. the last word. Um, I, I am an introvert and I'm most comfortable in my own space, which people always find strange. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like introvert. But my work... I learned how to navigate my work. Okay. Like I can I, understand that. Like I learned how to, you know, I learned how to be social and be out. And I had, had my own techniques in terms of doing that. Right? Um, but I spent a lot of time alone. I, when lockdown happened, my life didn't change. Yeah. 
it's like we move. Like my life is exactly the same. I I've been going to one public place since the beginning of lockdown. It was the only public place I went to before lockdown. Right. Mm-hmm. So I spend, you know, I'll sit on a Friday night and read. You know, or watch something. I'm I'm generally home. Mm-hmm. So Mel because, I mean, Mel is family, uh, we're very close. Our kids are all the same age. I mean, like my daughter, our daughters will go, you know, this was my first best friend. They've known each other since yeah. they were born, right? Um, yeah, the girls will go out and they'll come and leave me with five kids. And I'm just like, guys, hey, we're not shower, blah, blah, blah. And then I go chill and do my thing, right? Yeah. So that's my preferred state. And my son is the same. But it's a, it, it can be a problem because, you know, I'm 49 years old and have gone through, you know, have gone through certain things and have learned how to socialize. And I'll go, I don't, I don't necessarily think you should be withdrawing and living so much in your head when you're 14. Mm. Right. But, you know, kids don't, kids don't do what you say. They do as you do. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a given. So also that when you talk about doing the work and a friend of mine, Spiro and Pierre, he likes to talk about me, we have a group like doing the work, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that's the other aspect of being a parent. Like you have to constantly, and that's what I write about in the book. So when I say I'm constantly learning, a key lesson is that you have to constantly do the work on you because your kids are not going to just listen to what you say. They're going to do what you do, mm-hmm. right? Um, so it's, you know, it's with my son, especially navigating that, but it's been like the last two years as be becoming a teenager, like my daughter's nine, things are cool. That doesn't mean that around the corner, like in a month time, yeah, <laughs> she's going to go through like a moment or emotion. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, I thought we were good. Yeah. Things have been flowing. <laughs> What's this now? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, look, so the first book I was going to write was actually around fatherhood. Okay. So my intention had been, this was like 2012. I was going to write a book around fatherhood. Um, and then I thought of writing a business book. So still around fatherhood, but more around lessons I've learned from my children. Okay. Um, and look, it is constant. It's a constant thing. Like yeah. precedent. Children, especially when they're young, they'll teach you, you, you'll learn about president or you'll suffer for it for the rest of your life. Because with a child, when you say yes now, the assumption is that it's always a yes. It's always a yes. So you need to be able to present it in such a way, right? Um, And then consistency. Mm -hmm. So in the book I write about me, I use the keep them guessing technique. (laughs) Me, when you think I'm going to say yes, I say no. The next time you're like, ah, he's going to say no. I'll say yes. Yeah. Or I'll say, I think my, my kids would go, my daughter come and go, I know you're going to say no, but I'm like, then why are you bothering yeah, me? Yeah, then why are we having this conversation? If you know what I'm going to say no, then why, why are you even, <laughs> I was like, how? But sometimes you just want to like, I just want to let you know. It's an, I, you know? This yeah, it's, no, because it's a technique. <laughs> it's a, it's a maneuvering. Listen, a two week year old, a two week year old, a two week old baby. Mm-hmm. We'll manipulate the hell out of you. 100%. <laughs> and, and, and they do it better because we don't expect it, especially mm-hmm. as new parents. Like you're sitting there and it's like, ah, but they're a baby. Like they're yeah. so defense. I they'll <laughs> work you from day <laughs> one. Right? So yeah, yeah no, my, my technique has always been keep them guessing. So what, what, if, what lesson have you taught? Or what's the lesson you would like you teach? So if your son or your son and your daughter were here, what would they say? Like, what would you like them to say? Yeah, I don't know. They'd say that I'm, I'm mean. And always saying no. And always <laughs> boundaries. I'm the, but in I'm terms of a lesson, like what's the... Um, so the one thing, the one thing that I think they've learned... Mm-hmm. Um, which is important to both my wife and I. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a household and it's a family thing. Um, the one thing I've always taken pride in is when my children visit even their family, people come back and say they're always so polite. 
um, because so I mean even when they're getting a lecture it comes with a please or a thank you because it does not hurt to be polite to people um, and that carries over into everything else mm -hmm. I, I believe you know it carries over into everything else so the one thing that I'd like them to learn is is same thing my father taught me is that you know that respect and that acknowledgement for other human beings and to expect it f for yourself as well mm -hmm. um, and yeah and being able to and and being able to find your way um, being able to not be limited by you know like my I say to my son when he, he says if so I was always going to go to university. My father used to be an academic and he went into business. Like there was no negotiation. Yeah. Because like, I mean, I found that you also have like economics and yeah. You, yeah. My degree was planned when I was 15. Like my father's like, yo, I know it's nice. You're young. What are you going to do with your life? Yeah. So that's when, and I went into his area. So that's when my undergrad degree was planned. Mm. I say to my son, we don't know whether you're going to go to university because we're living in a very different world. So you need to figure out first what it is that you want to do. Then we can make that decision. Because, I mean, at some stages, like, I want to be a game developer. I'm like, yo, you can do that now. Mm. You can start learning it now. By the time you finish school, you're developing games. You can sell like um, yeah, a whole, right? yeah. So why must you now sit and go, okay, I have to go to university to do three years. Yeah. And I recognize the privilege. So I recognize that I can think like that because of the privilege of my background. And, and it's not privilege in terms of money, but it's just privilege in terms of access mm. and thinking. Um, and, and also in this country, I mean, despite a lot of us, our struggles, um, there are those of us who in this country represent the 1%. Even though we're a paycheck away from poverty, but for our environment. Yeah. You know, the fact that you and I are sitting in here in this space, when if you look at the majority of this country, and, you know, if you look at Alex and Santin, and for somebody sitting in Alex, Santin could just as well be Sudan. Yeah. Even though you can see it. Yeah. Right? So I recognize that privilege, like, and I don't, I don't take it for granted. Um, also because my, that privilege is there because of my father. Because I'm second generation university educated. My grandfather was a fisherman. Like I recognize that, you know, I'm very cognizant of the fact that it was through my father's actions and choices that I can sit now here with the opportunities that I've had, right? Yeah. Um, with my children. And I, I really believe that, you know, we're all links in a chain. And the responsibility of each chain is to take the collective a step up. So if my children now start off from the step I started off, then what did I do? Yeah. Cause Which I think is also picks up on, on, on black text. Cause you know, we are raised, well, most of us are raised who are first generation um, varsity mm. kids. You're raised to pick up where your father is, or where your parents not necessarily uh, level up but you need to start there at the bottom yeah because because sadly you need to pick them up yes right? before you can think about where you're gonna go yes like you're picking you're picking the collective up yes right? uh, whereas once you start getting that step further it's now all of a sudden you know the generation after you mm -hmm. they can then perhaps work on that and that's not to say, I mean, like my father, before he passed away, because we're both in business, we're both entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurship is hard. It's yeah. painful, right? Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. And my father was up and down. And he was at a stage where, like, I used to send my father money. Mm -hmm. And then he'd send me money when he gets money, right? Um, but just because of, and I think the starting point is, is, is this idea of access and opportunity. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a financial thing, mm -hmm. but it's the lessons and the tools I, I was given to be able to go, okay, I'm going to Joe Bing now. 
I don't know what I'm going to do in job work. And that's how I came to job work. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do there. I was doing business here all the time. I see all the, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do there. Well, I'll figure it out. Yeah. But I'm going to job work. To be able to say that is partially a mental thing. Mm -hmm. Because not to say that I'm the only person capable of doing that. Right? Mm -hmm. Pitch up in job work, 500 bucks in your pocket, went to a cousin of mine, that's had a, a furniture, furniture company, and I'm like, yo, man, can I do some work for you? Yeah. Right? I mean, it's a lot even for that time, but but the starting point was having, basically being able to say, actually, this is what I'm going to do. And a, a challenge for a lot of people is still the mental side of it. Because if you're battling the mental side and then the resource side, mm -hmm. it's two, you know, like the energy is in two things. Yeah. I don't have the mental side. Yeah. I'm not battling that. So I can put my energy into, okay, what am I going to do? Yeah. Um, because even black tax, like, like I said, I helped my father. And I remember after he passed away, the doctor was like, you know, he was very appreciative of the stuff that you did. I'm like, he was my father. Mm -hmm. Like, that's my job. Like, I'm a son. He was my father. My job is to, you know, yeah, um, to look after him. Uh, but it's, it wasn't, and it's not as extreme as the situation for a lot of South Africans because, the space between is not that big. Mm. It's you'll find it's your generation that are now having the access to opening the doors, You're right? Because my generation is not so far from you. I'm Gen X, same as you, same boat. We're in this. Nah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm I'm a year away from fifty. So yeah, now, I think so, that so, maybe. So now, uh, <laughs> when you talk about what what year were you born? Um, 1989. 1989. So 1989. You were still coming, planning your return back from Germany. No, so 19, oh. I went to Germany in 1990. So I did, so I did my O levels because I went through the British schooling system. I finished in 88. I was 16 in 88. So you see. So you talk about same generation. <laughs> 17 oh. years. You knew the stuff that I got up to in those 17 years. <laughs> I did for you. Okay, so we have reached the last segment, and this is where you literally just impart some words of wisdom from your lips to I'm someone else. Already. I feel like you have, but I mean, this is now I must find new co things. consciously I must saying find, it. I must find new things. Yeah, uh, let me play the jingle. From my lips to your ears. And it must be succinct and make sense. <laughs> I, I find it easier just to talk. And then as I keep talking, eventually something <laughs> comes out of it. That Winging it. <laughs> yeah, that, I do that a lot. Uh, I learned how to do that. Um, I don't know. Like, So one of the things that I've, and I've realized, particularly in the last, I'd say in the last couple of weeks, Having worked in magazine, I was having a conversation with somebody I used to work with, and I realized that even though I understand and I believe in this idea of being focused on the present and being focused on the now, um, I realized that because of the nature of our work, we were always you're always like two months ahead. Mm -hmm. And you know, because you've been in this space. Correct, right? I'm always, yeah. yeah. So you're always two months ahead. And that actually kind of rubs off on the present, mm -hmm. even though one is not conscious of it. Mm -hmm. And like I said, this is two weeks ago, I was having this conversation uh, with Papama actually. Oh. And and so, and I mean, I, I've read the books like Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle helped me through a very kind of difficult period because I lived very much in the past. And like my, my stories, my writing is always tied to the past. So learning how to be, how to be present and focused on the present. Um, and and so the probably the best words of wisdom I could give, which are basically just taken from Eckhart Tolle, and I know that we keep talking about it. We talk about mindfulness, mm -hmm. and we talk about being present. Um, I think it's remembering that you don't just decide it and it happens. It'll take like it takes time, and sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. I know I do, but what I found, especially in this, especially in this last kind of, this last what, 
14 months as we've sat through this pandemic. Focusing on right now has helped me navigate it much better because because when you're not in the now, what happens? You start thinking about the problems and the challenges. And and I literally got to the point where it was like, I know I owe people a whole bunch of money, but they're only phoning me in two weeks. Yeah. So well, now. now, if I stress about it now, the next two weeks are going to be hell. Yeah. So, do you know what? I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. But right now, uh, I've got this thing that I'm doing. And I'm just going to focus on this thing. And that's, I mean, it's, it carried me through, I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a weird way, I was wired for a global pandemic mm -hmm. because I've been living like this for, since I left Indal. Yeah. Like I've worked for my, and even before Indal, like I've worked for myself. Isn't it great? Cause I feel like I, same thing with me. Like I, after magazines, I've just been freelancing. So mm -hmm. when it hit, it was like, but. Hmm. So, home. like when the when the bank phones me, like when I owed them five years ago, I was still taking their calls. Yeah. So during lockdown, like you phone me, I'm like, hey, chief, I ain't got it. Like, <laughs> I'll get it. Yeah. I'm not running away. You have my details. Hundred percent. Um, whereas a lot of people, for a lot of people, it was just this totally new thing, right? Um, but yeah, that focus on that focus on now, and I and I sincerely believe that I am where. I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing and, and stuff will work out. Mm -hmm. um, so I try not to focus. I won't sit and focus and dwell on the negative. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think that for me is the best advice, but it's also to say that, look, you have to work at it. Mm -hmm. But if you work at it, you will actually feel, you'll have fewer headaches. I mean, I get tension headaches and just a change in perspective and a change in attitude has ensured that, you know, I get fewer headaches and I, I get those moments. Like yeah. I get those moments where I wallow and I want to just go deep and just be like, yeah, the whole world is out to get me. Yeah. But the more you think the whole world is out to get you, the more the world is out to get you. And with that, this we could go on because this yeah, is very yeah, interesting. Yeah, I we have to, to <laughs> sadly, we have to come to an end. Thank you so much for yeah, coming and thank you so much for agreeing. And because I mean, this is something that's been done for a month now. Yeah. So thank you so yeah, much. That's cool. Thank you. And I listened to your interview with Mel and I, and I, and I touched base with Mel. Mm -hmm. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to see Tiamo as well. How was it? And she only had good things. I was like, ah, no, then I'm fine. Oh, thank you. Just pitch up. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to read your book, reading your book, because it sounds interesting. It looks like it's going to be a good read. I hope so. I just, I, for me, I like, I'm interested in, in personal stories, not, um, you know, made up stuff. And I, I want to read and be like, ah, okay, this is the lesson. Yeah, get something. And so, I, I, I cover a spectrum of stuff. I mean, I go from the family, my father, my children. Mm. To writing about my thoughts on BE of all things and mm -hmm. identity and um, the what we're talking about, you know, the colored being colored or being perceived a particular way. Mm. And I talk about music, like I love music and I'm always listening to music and I talk about music and I talk about dining room tables and what dining room tables mean. <laughs> Not a time. <laughs> Kojo, thank you so much thank because you. we're never going to end if we start another conversation. Thank you so much for coming. You are still listening to the transcript or watching the transcript. Before I leave, I just want to give you a glimpse of something else that we have under the Your Media Stable. Lights, camera, action. What does it truly take to make, make it as a performing artist? How do you go from Zanzi Streets to the world stage? Join Noni and Belissa for an educational, inspirational show for youth aspiring to join the performing arts. Taking an honest view of the industry, the show aims to prepare them for a profession in the arts. Subscribe to on your media, 
You can subscribe on YouTube, listen on any good pla podcast platform, or find it on www.yourmedia.co.za. Your media, hashtag where you are. I am Tiamo Murisane, and this is The Transcript.